Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm very excited to have with me today for this episode Derek Schulman of Gentle Giant, uh, a, a an, and a giant in the music industry. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure, Michael. Nice to see you. So we're here to talk a little bit about Civilian. The reissue dropped uh, today as we're recording this on May 20th. And uh, the, on digital and CD, the vinyl reissue will come later this year. Uh, but I want right. to start out by... Uh, um, asking you a little bit more about your background first. First of all, I, I want to thank you for being here because I had Ray on episode 12. So you guys are the first brother combination to be on Michael's record collection. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> 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 no, actually Ray's great. Ray, Ray, Ray's a, was a star. So I, I didn't know he was on, but uh, that's good to know. Good to know. Um, in fact, I, I believe Ray's episode so far has been my most downloaded show. So no pressure, Derek. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll take a note of that. <laughs> um, so Ray was telling me, obviously, you guys, uh, when you were young and getting into music, it wasn't yet, this whole rock and roll phenomenon really hadn't taken root yet. So were you listening to a lot of jazz when you were a kid or, or big band or what, you know, what was your sort of musical introduction? Well, I, the Schulman musical, music, uh, musical introduction was, uh, of course, my father. Uh, who was a, a jazz trumpeter um, and a band leader. Uh, and so music and musicians were always in my house. I mean, you know, after, after he did the gigs in the evening uh, with the band, and they played dance music, and, but his love was modern jazz and classical, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting. So mu musicians were always uh, around the house for as long as I can remember. So it was, it was almost like uh, osmosis that, it would, and genet genetics, I would say, that uh, it, it tra trickled down to the, his, um, his offspring, if you like. So it, in your time with Gentle Giant, you did vocals, you did saxophone, recorder, bass, percussion, keyboards. You guys all did a lot of things and basically picked up whatever was handy. Um, and you, you played something called a shulberry. Can you tell us a little bit about what a shulberry is? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, the truth be told, effectively, a shulberry is a piece of wood with a pickup on, uh, tuned to the violin uh, um, tuning, uh, because that's kind of what we used uh, for, um, was it playing the game? Yeah, uh, uh, we hit the, uh, the violins, open strings, together with a xylophone to make that sound. And, and to do it live, obviously, you know, to, to hit a, uh, Ray had a violin, but we didn't want to hit it with a string, with a, with a drumstick because he couldn't have used it otherwise. So we, uh, so the Irodes, in fact, invented this, this instrument that looked stupid. <laughs> it kind of was stupid actually, but, but, uh, a lot of people asked about it. And basically it was an open stringed, um, violin tuned piece of, uh, wood with four strings on it. That is yeah. what it was. Well, you guys were always very adventurous and experimental. Um, Civilian was an album released in early 1980. It was the band's 11th and turned out to be final studio album. Um, it is not, it has not gotten the full 5.1 uh, surround Adobe Atmos Stephen Wilson treatment. Are the are, are the multi tracks still missing for this album? No, the multi tracks are available, um, uh, but um, this is uh, the album was um, was a, an album which was not in our possession. We just have a transferred it to our catalog very recently from Sodi. Um, so uh, Stephen wasn't able to uh, put his, his, his uh, um, watermark, if you like, on it. Um, however, uh, in the late summer, uh, we are releasing a Stephen Wilson remix of Interview with the Atmos 5.1. Um, uh, Stephen has done, uh, done that as well as um, towards the end of the year, Missing Peace, which Stephen has also uh, remixed for us. Uh, he's, a, he's a great friend and, and he's a good fan as well and, and a great musician himself. Yeah, and he's he's very well known with the, the Dolby Atmos and the 5.1 mixing. He is, I mean, he's he's won awards. He's he's one of the best in the business. So you're in good hands there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We you know, trust his, uh, his judgment for the most part <clears throat> at any time. And he's... Um, yeah, he's he's a friend as well, and he's you know, that. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, he didn't didn't do this one, but he's um, perhaps that will happen 
in 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 the future but this is just a remastered version mm -hmm. of an album which kind of was overlooked i think back in the day and and um and that's why i think it it, it really needed a relook to the, a relook from our fans to to show them that uh this wasn't um some new band that that didn't sound like gentle giant this was gentle giant but it was a there was a gentle giant which i i personally love honestly uh and and um it it wasn't it, no it wasn't octopus it wasn't uh freehand but it was still what we were doing yeah. um and um yeah i think it turned out very well so you've got the the bonus track on <clears throat> heroes no more which i like this song so much I, I really um it's a shame it wasn't on the original but uh what else was done for this reissue specifically? You know, maybe you can talk to the technical aspect of of what was done to the album for this particular reissue, as opposed to, say, for the Unburied Treasure box set. Well, the the album was was, was completely um, remastered, uh, and in fact, uh, Heroes No More was remixed uh, actually by a guy called Dan Bordermark in in um, in Sweden, um, and. Um, effectively we uh tweaked it so it sounded it's actually sounded back in the day uh really i think it's one of the best sounding records we had and in fact jeff emmerich uh, who was the engineer and the beatles engineer of course you know for for their uh, for their most well-known music uh in fact was our the shulman brothers first ever engineer ever as well in abbey road went in my first group so it was almost like a bookend in certain respects because he was there at the very beginning of when we were recording at the and at the very end in la so it was kind of interesting in that respect what was involved with getting the rights back for the civilian album can you take me through that process well i basically uh, went to sony who uh, claimed ownership which they do have in fact and said let's uh, license it from you and, and um We'll give you a piece, of will, and we'll give, we'll we'll take the most of it. But we have to do the work, mm -hmm. which we did, of course, and spent the money to to get it done and get it out there, um, and uh, and um, for you know a fairly decent uh, amount of time. So it's 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 not uh, rocket science, effectively, to do <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but it's the only uh, um, it's the only piece of our catalog, if you like, in North America. That we don't actually own, you know, the rest of the album uh, albums we have done um, is owned by the band, and, and the label that our band has called Alucard. So now it's out on Alucard today, as you said. Yeah. So uh, hope uh, you know. Hope people will re-listen who would, who had heard it before and say this is not quite what we remembered. I uh, will listen to it with fresh ears, if you like. Yeah, I will say that. Um regardless of how maybe controversial the album was amongst your your biggest fan base i love this album i think it's a very strong album and it you know to me i i don't it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to have the the patented gentle giant um weirdness if you like <laughs> uh it doesn't have to be um extremely experimental or or um complicated it it just they're good songs well that, exactly and, and and i think i think it was played really well um i think that it sounds really good um and uh yeah do we switch from five four to seven eight to four four to three four no but nevertheless i mean the playing is 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 good and we kept it a little more straightforward i think obviously for a reason because it was uh you know we were uh to tell you the truth looking for some kind of in quotes commercial success unfortunately we that there was a there was this album on columbia after capital um and, Col and columbia basically didn't really push the button uh for several reasons and therefore it kind of got lost in the shuffle of our catalog and that's when we thought let, let, let's 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 at least have the fans and, and new people have a listen to it because this one was a very much an under, undersung album, mm -hmm. um, as far as I think the, the music and the albums that, that we're known for, known for um, are you know are, are out. Um, 
And um, so I, I thought, let me let me let me try to do a deal with them. And they said, okay, fine. And uh, we here here we are with with the album uh, in stores. I think today or whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> you you started to move toward a little bit more of a not necessarily commercial, but maybe more accessible approach. Um, you know, back for you know freehand and interview even you know you that that kind of that progression toward a more accessible sound started did the fact that this album was written and recorded in los angeles uh contribute at all to the the more accessible approach or was that just always the the plan going in no i think it did i think it contributed a great deal to uh to how it was written how it was how it sounded um we we recorded it at sound city and and uh, a little studio in in, um, in West Ho in Hollywood, and then we mixed it back in in the UK. Um, yeah, I think it did contribute to the to the to the overall feel of the album because um, you know the truth be told, all the bands that we were kind of in in the um, bagged in the same league, if you like, in the prog world, which was non-existent in those days, that world prog, but we were kind of bagged into that world today, where where um, were either making hit singles like you know uh, uh, like Genesis and, and and yes or or kind of like floating away into little clubs and we didn't want to do we I guess what we were trying to do was make something a little more accessible for radio which was you know which was now becoming uh, formatted to a certain kind of song rather than albums when we started of course radio was a different kind of uh, different animal. They play one side of an album, or even one album. Mm -hmm. In 1980, they were playing the hit from the big bands, and so Genesis, Yes, uh, etc., had their hit. And unfortunately, Chetel Giant weren't able to come up with the hit. So you know, maybe that's that's for the for the best, actually, um, because you know, because sometimes it could be a, a millstone around your neck. I think everybody wants to have a number one record at some point. Everybody wants to be popular or have their their songs be you know very well received. But how much satisfaction do you get from having such a loyal and rabid and consistent fan base, the kind that gobbles up a a two or three thousand uh, unit box set in in just a matter of hours? I mean, I mean what does that what does that feel like for you? No, it, it feels fantastic. The fact that um... The music is still relevant, if you like, 40 plus years after we last even went into the studio and, and, and a different generation, uh, you know, even two generations are, are discovering uh, what we did and, and how we did it um, and uh, are online um, doing the very same thing and, and learning and, and teaching as well. It's just very gratifying, honestly. And in fact, um, my son, uh, Noah, who, uh, who works at Sony, but he's, he's, uh, um, he never, he was born after we, after we, yeah, we, 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 uh, um, we broke up the band, um, has always, since he was a kid, said, you guys, you want, you guys got together and, and, um, he, uh, uh put together during the, uh, lockdown, um, the fan video of Proclamation. Mm -hmm. Um, because he saw that so many young people were playing along with, you know, gentle young people, not and, and older people, of course, but were playing along, and um, that was a um, that was quite a success. In fact, it was the uh, prog event of the year in Prog Magazine last year. Um, so that was quite something. It, it's gratifying, honestly, to to know that um, the music we made is um, is still vital today. Yeah, the proclamation video was uh, was very cool. It was the first time that you had all been on video together uh, in what four decades. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, correct. Did it yeah. did it fuel anything in you guys to to maybe think wouldn't be a bad idea to to put an album out or or write some maybe write a song or two? No, <laughs> no? <laughs> you guys are all busy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's there's a you know you. you Again, you can't recreate history, uh, and that was a, p a piece of history. Mm -hmm. and, and when it, when the the, the the day is over and then that comes, the, that, yeah, the, or the chapter closes, 
you can't reopen it and, and rewrite it. Uh, so it's, it would be it would be a wrong it would be wrong for me personally and emotionally. But it would be, wrong, it'd be it would be wrong for I know the fans. Some fans would like to you know see that and hear that, but I don't think it would it would be the same. It, there was a period of time when we were doing it for I mean we were pretty selfish actually in, in a lot of ways because we were doing it for ourselves first, pushing mm-hmm. ourselves to be better for each other. And then, you know, and then going on stage and, and, and having fun, literally fun together, playing what we rehearsed at the, uh, in a rehearsal. And hopefully people will show up and see us and pay money. And, and at least we were put, able, be able to put bread on the table. So that era, you can't recreate. It's, it's something that is, is, um, is part of history. Mm-hmm. What can you tell me about... Um making this album do you are there any any stories any memories that stick out to you uh, from these civilian sessions yeah well yes there, there are uh to be honest with you there there was it was it was quite a hard album to make honestly for uh for a lot of us because we were almost just dis- we were kind of like fish out of water uh you know i was actually living in la um for whatever for whatever reason um i I moved out there by, with my wife um and so that was part of the reason why we we all got together in l a um but the, it was hard very hard for the you know a couple of the guys ray and and Carrie uh we were living in rented apartments so it was kind of like um we were again it felt it felt very odd the atmosphere was an odd atmosphere. Uh, but we knew we had to put our heads down and and, and work hard on it. But it was it felt like um, a, a, not a, not a hard album to make because it came together. But it was a, the atmosphere of doing it was uh, uncomfortable. Um, in the same respect that um, in a glass house was an uncomfortable album to make. Uh, different periods of time, there are certain things that. Um, that uh, emotionally, physically are uprooting. And that this is one in the glass house was, I'm, br- I'm bringing that up because that was the first album we made as a five piece, you mm-hmm. know, uh, after yeah, my brother Phil left. So yeah, it was, a, it was a, I remember that it was a, not, a, it wasn't an un- unhappy period, but it was a period of time when uh, we felt kind of like a little um, foreign effectively it's weird a weird feeling but nevertheless <laughs> i think uh you know we we pulled it off and and it um again it sounded like it we wanted it to sound unfortunately um the record company in in, in the uh, didn't didn't push the the green button that it did with other bands and so therefore it was kind of lang- languished at number 189 on the charts or whatever it was and then get further so it was kind of overlooked. Yeah. In your catalog, I think it's overlooked, but I, I think from, from number one through inside out is a fantastic run of songs. I know that you have said in the past that you really enjoy inside out. Is that your favorite track from this album or do you have a favorite? No, I think inside out is, is a, is a fantastic track actually. I mean, it's got a super, I think it's a fantastic atmospheric track that, um, that's played really well. I mean, it's 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 not simple. I mean, it, you, it sounds like it's a simple album, simple song, but it really isn't. And I think the emotion of that track, um, and and the playing of that track is is uh, is it's almost one of my. It, it makes. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like um, <laughs> my ego is getting getting it better of me, but it sounds it gives me actually sort of shivers when I hear it because I think it's so well done. And and the climatic uh, gong and and me singing in the higher register, um, which is which was a reach I remember, um, was uh, it, I think it's it's one of our you know most um, inspiring not not really inspiring songs is it not an inspirational song it's a very downer song actually it's about basically a, a drug a drug overdose mm-hmm. um, which. Uh, which um okay truth be told i've I, you know i've only done uh 
asset once in my life, um, and it was given to me un unknowing to me. And that was the feeling I felt at 18 years old when somebody told me somebody slipped me some acid, and I was hanging onto a lamppost for 12 hours. Oh. And, in, and that's what I felt like. I felt like I was inside out for 12 mm. hours. I thought I was dead. And this is what the song sounds. I, I hope that conveys in, conveys that feeling in the song. Well, I hope, I hope you know it, the feeling of what that is 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 apparent in that song. Yeah, it has this haunting uh, quality to it. In the um, uh, "Do I Need Lifting" part, it, it, I I love the repetitive uh, sort of haunting nature of that part. What do you remember? What led to that bit? As I said, I mean, I, I, I remembered the feeling and, and, and holding on, and I was alone. It was outside a London club. I was a kid, and, and, and I thought, man, I'm, am I going to die? Is someone, is someone going to help me, basically? And that was, that was, that was a lyrical part. But no, that was, um, that's, that's why that part was in, uh, that uh, you know, chor chorus part was there. Um, because I, I, you know, it was a bad trip <laughs> and then, and a trip and a trip I'll never go on again. I never did, of course. Yeah. And, and one that you didn't plan. In no, not, anyway. not, not at all. It was, a, yeah. it was planted on me. Yeah. Uh, I love underground. The, it, it's got a very sort of, uh, Alan Parsons vibe to it. Um, and one of the things I, I felt was interesting about this album too, was the song, I am a camera which uh in an odd coincidence yes released into the lens in 1980 which repeats the the phrase uh, i am a camera and uh and then right. the buggles of course put it on their album as well um where does that come from that phrase i am a camera come from well it was it was the phrase that it, well it was a it was a book by christopher isherwood um but um it was it was uh, a song um, about the big brother looking at you. I mean, mm -hmm. we uh, it, that's that's kind of what it was about. And we started off with a click of we we, we like those little tricks of of, uh, of having time signatures with uh, utilizing other other things rather than a kind of a tap of a cymbal or, or a tap of a, uh, a you know uh, a tambourine. We use the click of a um, the camera to to uh, lead us into the song. Um, so it was a bit about you know, Big Brother. I, I didn't know that. I had no idea that Yes and 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 uh, those, those you know any, anyone else was going to name. I think we were the first. Uh, so let me take credit. Like, let let Gigi <laughs> take credit for that one. Okay. Uh, I, so that that no, it's good. It's a good song. I, I like I like that song, but I prefer um, yeah. I, I, my favorites are uh, Number One and um, and. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, um, obviously, uh, inside, you know, out. inside out. Yeah, yeah. I just blank for a bit. Of, yeah, <laughs> I, I do that all the time. Um, senior, senior moments. <laughs> Heroes no more. Tell me a little bit about this track. It was added for the a CD release. I believe originally uh, the one way issue had this on it, but it wasn't on the original album. It was there was not enough room. This is one of my favorite tracks on this version of Civilian. Um, what went into that song, and and how hard was it to leave a song that good off the album originally? Well, we, yeah, we had to make a decision about um, it was it was it was left off because of the size. I mean, the length of an album, as you know, uh, or as people may know, uh, and when you put an LP together, it's got to be a certain amount of time. Otherwise, it goes into very tiny grooves, and you won't hear it. it it'll it'll be you know compressed, and and so we had to leave off one track. And that, that the track that, that was left off was, um, I think we thought that it was a little too commercial, if you like, and therefore, uh, I mean, boy, you know, we, we were going in a direction which is, which was a bit, little more straightforward. We figured, boy, if the fa if the fans um, uh, are 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 um, what, you know concerned about where we're going putting that song on there i mean they'll be complete i mean we'll play to a, we'll play to a, a toilet next uh, next tour with three people in with only three people in there including myself oh man um but it, but you're right. that. I, it, it, no but in fact actually it's it i like having reheard it and had it re heard it on the album and heard it um being remixed it's it's a good song it's a very good song actually yeah 
you guys did a video for it, a, a lyric video for that. You also did a video for Inside Out. Um, did you guys, did you get involved with that or did you just kind of hire somebody else to take care of that? No, we, in fact, my son Noah um, took, was, was, uh, ha, ha, did it basically. He's directed and did the, uh, the, the illustrations and animation. That's what he does for, for, he works for Sony actually. He's a head of creative for um, Sony um, uh, Legacy. So uh, he's, he's been you know, very instrumental in, in keeping the band's profile up and, and, and alive, which, you know, I tip my hat to him. Yeah. He's proud. Um, another track from around this period, you haven't a chance, was originally uh, on a on a compilation album under construction. Uh, was there any thought to using that here on the reissue? Uh, which track was that? Which one? It's uh, you haven't a chance. I was. Oh yeah, that was a yeah, care. No, not really. I mean, we we there's as uh, a whole litany of things actually un, is under construction. I, that's, I actually just listened to it. Uh, the other day, uh, of various ideas um, and and bits and bobs and bits and pieces, uh, and you know sometimes when you daydream or nightdream or, or whatever, um, there's a lot of stuff on there that could be put together to make an album, which could be really really interesting. But there's no way we're going to do that. But um, certainly, um, yeah, these are you know we we you know for the most part the writings. The writing uh, of the music was about eighty-five percent, you know, Carrie and and Ray. I mean, forty percent, uh, forty-two or forty-three percent each of those, and then the fifteen percent of the music was mine. Um, and then lyrically, originally it was me and Phil, and then ultimately me and myself. Um, and that's that stuff, if you like, is all on that uh, under construction, which is ideas, bits, bobs, uh, you know, little things that you twiddle around with and, and uh, you say, man, that's not good. Well, that piece is pretty good. And, 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 and uh, it was caught by our friend in Denmark and, and put together as a, a kind of an interesting subtext, if you like, to Gentle Giant's writing career. Yeah. At what point in the process, uh, like, for example, was the album finished when you guys kind of knew that, that Gentle Giant was going to call it a day? Um, well, the album came out, um, and, and it kind of didn't do what we wanted it to do. Um, at the same time, uh, I was married with it with a child and so was Carrie, uh, and it was getting harder to, um, to leave family, uh, for, you know, months on end. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was, and also to tr uh, truth be told, um, we'd seen other bands of, again of our ilk from the UK, uh, who were on the same level as where we were. Uh, and, and as I said, radio had changed, so therefore, and, and they were able to change with, with what the times were, what times needed. Uh, so as you know, Genesis came up with hit singles, uh, yes, came up with their you know, owner, or whatever it was, owner of a lonely heart, that was a little laughter, but certainly the everyone was looking for a hit song mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to playing music. And um, General Giant was never able to do that. Mm -hmm. So honestly, it was when we all got together before the tour in, in, in North America, to be quite honest with myself, we all had a meeting with the band and, and I announced with Carrie that we weren't going to continue after this tour. And... Um, the rest of the guys, you know, and Ray said, "Okay, I told, I told, told, told Ray, and and uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, Ray, I think Gary and John were a little up, disappointed, but it, it was, it was, it was time. It was, it was time. I, you know, there's there's a period of time when when the um, the, the, the sort of uh, energy and and the um, just the sort of feel of, of what we were was starting to dis dissipate. Mm -hmm. and, and when that happens, when it feels like a job, it's, you know, truth be told, you know, again, we were going out to, to support an album. And it felt like we were touring as a, as a job rather than having fun playing. And, and anyone who feels like that as a musician, that 
okay, we've got to go and, and sit, you know, go play, go in Buffalo and, and Peoria and this, that, and the other. Oh, here we go again. When, and when it starts to feel like that, it's time to say, okay, that's not, this is not working. Mm-hmm. This is not what we wanted. This is not what we did it for. We did it to enjoy playing and, and, and loving what we do. When it was just clocking in, that's kind of what it felt like on the last tour. And when, when it feels like that, it's time to say, stop. Do, you know, you're, doing, you're not authentic anymore. Mm-hmm. Although the last tour was actually a lot of fun knowing that was the case. You know, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Is, did, it, did it make it so that you sort of stopped and smelled the roses those last few shows? Did it, did it make you it's, savor that? If effectively correct. Yes, it did. Because knowing that we, you know, we, we didn't have to um, you know, clock in again, um, it, was a, it was probably one of the most enjoyable tours. Believe it or not. It's bizarre to say that. <laughs> um, it's because you know, it, we, we toured and worked a great deal over the 10 years of our existence. Yeah. I mean, we were we were workers. We didn't, you know, spend you know months on end slaving over, uh, you know, get it jamming in a studio or going to the, the south of France or God knows where. We toured, we we recorded, and then we rehearsed, and then we toured again. And and we we were we were pretty hard working uh, uh, musicians. Derek, tell it's, me about your transition from gentle giant musician to. Uh, record executive you you know this is not a, a transition that a lot of musicians end up making um was that a desire on your part to begin with or did you kind of just fall into that <laughs> it was you know <laughs> i mean i wasn't biting my nails saying god i better be a i can't wait to be a record executive no, <laughs> absolutely not in fact it was almost like uh you know it, us and them uh and um However, you know, I was in California, as I said, and I got this call from a friend, um, you know, and, and I was deciding, okay, I, when, we, when we stopped touring, um, all of us kind of like said, okay, what now? Um, Ray f- produced a couple of, uh, uh, Ray became a producer, um, not instantly, but, you know, we, and I, I was offered to produce several bands, but I didn't, I didn't want to fall into that, you know, being in, locked up in for, locked up in a, in a room for, you know, 12 or 15 hours for weeks on end either. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, honestly, truthfully, I wasn't quite sure where things were going. And then I got a call from a friend who had who had worked for Chrysalis Records in England where we were signed, who was, living, who was now in New York uh, doing international. And he said, what are you up to? He said, well, you know, he said, how, how, have you ever thought about working for a record company? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, however, he said, well, you know, we, this whole new company, Polygram, which is a combination of uh, Siemens and Polydor, two U- European companies going together, we're, we're, we're looking for a, a rock department and you'd be great to have, you know, if you're interested in talking to the guy who's a the boss there. And I said, hey, what the hell? And they, they, like, you know what? I need, to, I need to make a living anyway. So w- why not find out what, what it is? Um, so I went to New York and, and um, met with uh, Jerry Jaffe, actually, who's the head of the rock department. And he knew that I was obviously in a band and, and two of the biggest fans of the band were um, important radio consultants. Uh, Lee Abrams, and a radio was king then, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, um, and Jeff Pollock. And they were both fans of the band. And he figured, let me hire this guy because... Then I'll, I'll get the, my, my groups, which he loved, like with Jam and, and, and you know, the things that I was not a huge fan of, nevertheless. At least he can get, get to them and, and get calls in. So, I, to, truthfully, you know, I, I got the job because I knew two people. And so, anyway, he was offered, he said, Why do you come and be part of this new rock department? Uh, and I said, about what do you think? And she said, Go for it. So, I came to New York and lived in a, you know, a, uh, for three months uh, in, a, in a rented, you know, one bedroom uh, hovel on the west side of myself, and then you know, and um, it was it was I became Darth Vader. <laughs> I, was, I joined <laughs> I, I joined I joined the dark side. In fact, I do remember the very first day going around the offices, and and. And I was showing my office, which is a tiny little space. And, and I went from office to office to meet the people there and I'm working with. And I realized on the first day, after having come off the road the year before, um, that 
the music business was not what it was made out to be. It was ultimately, you know, because I met everyone, there were people in marketing, sales, you know, uh, promotion, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was no online stuff then, but it was all, it was a very different thing. And um, it was about the business of music, not the music business. And I, and I thought, oh shit, I should have known this years ago. You know, that this is where the decisions are made. It's not, it's not how great, you, it is how great you are live and how great you are musically. But ultimately where you get the biggest pushes are from those people who are sitting in these offices. So I learned, I mean, I, you know, it, I, I hate to say it, but I had to learn the hard way. Um, and I learned pretty quickly. Um, so that was my introduction, and and, and on the, literally on the first day when I you know, met all these people, I, I I said to myself, I can't wait to get out of this. And of course, you know, <laughs> forty years later, I'm still in it. So yeah. uh, what can I say? <laughs> oh wow! So you were with you were with Polygram, Atco, and Roadrunner, and you've signed a lot of heavy bands, like really popular heavy bands, Dream Theater, Pantera, Slipknot. Do you have a personal affinity for heavy music as opposed to lighter styles of music? No, I have a good affinity to bands that are, um, that want and see, it's, it's really interesting, want and, and are able to see the biggest picture and nothing will stop them. Uh, it, it's something, you know, a drive, a drive which, um, which only, you know, which only the band musicians can, um, can understand you know and and no matter who signs them um uh they won't be stopped uh you know we had in, in certain respects gentle giant had that i mean we were we were never hugely giant uh, popular well we were actually really popular in certain uh, certain countries um uh, italy for instance and germany and and even french speaking canada we, we played to thirty thousand people um but um but a lot of the bands that uh, I w was involved in, I learned to, if you like, to balance uh, commercial, the commercial world with um, the uh, the um, the world I was I was living in. As I said, I realized that um, the music was uh, music certainly was not secondary, but it was certainly uh, an important. What what was more important is who made the decisions, who spent the money and how the money was spent and who they spent it on. And so I was able to understand and realize what that was and hopefully it gave my perspective on you know, making some of the bands, like, as you said, Green Theater, Pantera. But I think I, Pantera, I mean, some of these musicians are superb. Pantera, I became a huge, I, when I went to see them in this little club in, in Dallas um, and I was running the company, I became a, a, a huge fan. I, they, were, they were brilliant, just not yeah. just good, they were brilliant. Were they gentle giant? No, but they were certainly a brilliant band in their own own in their own uh, aspect. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I learned how. I, I, I guess I had it in my calling. I, I, why I don't know, but I did. I I just was curious about the the heavy uh, music as, aspect because I always felt like you guys were from that classic progressive era. You guys were one of the heaviest bands of of yeah, those. We, Classic we, rock bands. We were a rock band. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we're we're bagged into the the prog world and whatever, whatever that means. I mean, we but we were never a band that would play you know fifteen minutes on a mellotron pretending that we were the uh, Royal Symphony Orchestra or whatever it was. <laughs> you know, we 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 move move things around. And Gary and and John, I mean, you know, and and Rep, they were great. You know, I mean, listen to this. Listen to the uh, riffs that we we came. At. They're hardcore. You know, this is, we were heavy, we're a rock band and we mm. love rocking and we had fun rocking out. Yeah. Um, last year I spoke with Billy Sherwood, uh, that was episode five, I think, about his Arc of Life project. You had a hand in the production of that album. How did you get involved with that and, and how active are you these days as, uh, you know, with, with, you know, as a producer or as a consultant for a production? Well, with Billy, uh, Billy is is, is a, a great friend, and, and you know I signed uh, World Trade, as you probably know, and then put him together with with uh, Chris Squire. Um, you know, he's he's still a, you know a real buddy, and, and I you know he, he wanted to do to do this album, and we met several times, and I kind of like sat down with him in in in, uh, in LA 
a couple of years ago before COVID, um, and uh, went through the songs. But I, you know, I wasn't involved hands on, but I'm, I'm hands on with uh, a couple of bands, and, and but I'm getting more involved in, um, believe it or not, uh, something I know nothing about, <laughs> but I'm enjoying learning about is is the uh, musical documentary uh, stuff, which is. Um, become au courant, if you like, these days on all these streaming services. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm involved in three or four of them. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I still like to learn and, and like to go think for, forward um, about, about things that have not been, stories that haven't been told. What I'm interested actually in, to tell you the truth, is the new progressive music, which is, for the most part, and I know, you know, if you like Gentle Giant fans may, may well say, what the hell is he talking about? But some of the hip hop music today, they uh, actually are more musically um, involved with really good music than, than the general public. Uh, we've, Gentle Giants had some, uh, believe it or not, three or four number ones after all this time having our music sampled by bands like, uh, you know, Tribe Called Quest or Common, and recently with um, Run The Jewels. Uh, in fact, we were, our knots were sampled for um, uh, the Black Panther movie as the leading track. So it's, a, it's an interesting world that they've looked back and said, this is a band we could get our little riffs off. And it's interesting to see that, you know, and, and I think that's kind of the new, the new progressive, if you like. Yeah. They find things in it which are very interesting um, and, and intriguing. Yeah. Derek, is, is there anything you can, any hints you can tell us about some of these uh, music documentaries that you're, you're talking about? Any, or is it too early? Uh, it's, it's, they're, all, all in, they're all in sort of like uh, different stages of uh, development. So I think uh, at some point in an era, you know, a month or two, I'll be able to say, okay, here they are. Uh, but uh, they're, they're, they're all interesting. Um, you know, they're, <laughs> the, I, I, I'll, I'll mention one which is, is kind of um, uh, yeah, actually very interesting because it's to very today and it's, a, it's about something which is going on which is awful in Russia. Um, we, I and uh, when I was running ADCO, um, we put on, or mourners put on the biggest ever outdoor show ever in Moscow. Uh, the Moscow Monsters of Rock mm -hmm. uh, show in, uh, for a free concert, and 1.7 million people showed up. Uh, but the story behind that was, it, it was worse, it was not worse, it was in, a, as intriguing, if you like, as a James Bond movie. Literally bring, you know, drag, bringing you know, suitcases full of cash to give to Boris Yeltsin, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about that and the concert, which included ACDC, Metallica, Pantera, uh, you know, on that show. So that, that's, that's in development and that's one which is closest to being uh, greenlit by one of the streaming companies. The, the other ones I, I can't really talk about because they're a little closer to home and, and they'll, be very, they'll be very interesting for the fans of General Guy, I think. Well, we'll have to be on the lookout for that. You mentioned uh, another Stephen Wilson mix coming out. Uh, what else is coming up that uh, General Giant fans can be on the lookout for? Well, there's a uh, well, there's an interview which is coming up in in um, late summer. Missing piece, Steve Stevenson as uh, there's at Boss Five Point One Surround for both of those, and there's a, a box set of um, uh, in August of uh, ten albums, live albums, LPs, uh, which are um, which have never been heard. They're not on the box set. They're not um, on the. Uh, that, th these are these are albums that literally have never been heard uh, before. Wow! Um, in in vinyl, uh, and that's coming from Snapper in the UK. So we gave them a license to to go ahead and and and, and go for it. So so that's <laughs> coming out in in the, uh, you know it, it's weird. It's weird that we've had uh, the interesting thing is is that we've having not. And being the monster band that we, you know, we hoped we hoped we were we could be, but certainly we, we were we were up there. But there's a ton of music and a ton of footage, television footage that we can call on that we've we that for whatever reason that we were filmed and, and recorded by so many people 
um, that um, there's a lot of stuff that we could call on to to uh, show anyone who is interested. Yeah. Are there any albums that you still haven't been able to locate multi tracks for, or that you know that they're gone forever? No, the one one album which I'd love and everyone would love to get hold of, uh, and and anyone listening to to listen to listening to this cast here uh, would be in the glass house because that's the first the first one that Stephen actually asked is that do you have the multis of that tr that album because I just love this album, um, and uh, that's the only album that we cannot find any multis of. Uh, you know, it, God knows where they went. We've looked everywhere. We've asked everyone, um, and they're they're either they either went up in a puff of smoke or destroyed or something. If anyone out there knows where they are, please let us know because we'd love to reattack that one in particular because it was a very special album and actually a very hard album to make, a very um, emotionally draining album. But when I reflect back on it, it's a really good album. Um, it's a you know very um an album which has memories that, that evoke the transition from a six piece to a five piece and brother the brotherly split and all the other stuff that goes along with that yeah so civilian dropped today digitally and on cd you get that all the usual places the vinyl is going to be held up a little bit longer we have the the worldwide uh, vinyl pressing plants, uh, trying to keep up with demand, not being able to do it. Uh, sounds like maybe that's where the money is, is to open up a vinyl pressing plant. But uh, <laughs> uh, we'll get a civilian uh, LP later in the year. Uh, Derek Shulman, thank you so much for your time and, and helping me uh, dissect this album and, and your career. And, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. My pleasure too, Michael. Okay. <laughs>